My name's Steve Hornberger and uh, welcome to the third in a series of four master classes uh, building on the pillars from Breaking Barriers Toolkit from a couple of years ago. Um, Richard Connect is my buddy and uh, partner in this process. And um, uh, we take turns, this is my turn. And today I think you're gonna be really fascinated and, and, and appreciate our two guest speakers who will introduce themselves a little later. Katie Eckert from, who is, refers to herself as a health and human services leader in California and well she is. And Pam Smith, who's from San Diego Health and Human Services Administration and Live Well Schools. And has both of them done some incredible work in the area of financing and improving services and, and supports. Um, these, this series of master classes is uh, sponsored by the Mental Health Services Oversight and Accountability Commission, the Social Policy Institute and Integrated Human Services Group. And we're all pleased to be able to provide this for the greater California health and human services and child and family systems. Our purpose here is pretty straightforward. We wanna create a community of practice to learn from one another and about what works and what doesn't and how to get started. We wanna share resources and support of interconnected, interconnected systems um, and to align actions for mandated tasks as well as for the new 2083 MOU goals. We wanna build space for informal peer-to-peer -peer coaching. Um, we're all better when we're working one, with one another rather than thinking we have to do everything like the firemen are the champion of the solitary champion. Um, th this, while these master classes are focused on skill building and not about policy per se, uh, they will help us begin to inform as all of the health and human service systems begin to do the reforms that they are coming due in this year and next year. And we wanna in, in, engage uh, community voices. Some of the context, as you all by now are well aware of uh, 2083 and the, the 58 counties making their MOUs um, to seek re revenue maximization and sustainability. But I'd also add to improve the access, quality, and outcomes of care that was provided. Uh, pending and future uh, reforms are listed. You know, we've had FERS, we've had the Mental Services Grant, and the FFPSA that's coming on board. Next slide. So what we try to do here is um, reflect on research on collective impact and how it, it impacts and, and demonstrates and manifests itself in those four pillars. We've had the first one was on shared leadership. Last one was about shared data and outcomes. This one, we're gonna be talking about finance, shared finance and revenues. And finally, the next one in the final in our series will be about shared community. All of these resources are available at the Breaking Barriers website. And we would suggest that you, when you get a chance, take a look at the Breaking Barriers toolkit and all the resources that are listed there. Next slide. Because overall, if we had to put it down to one sentence, our goal in Breaking Barriers is to, to begin to achieve this, this vision of a one child, one plan, so that there's not an education plan and a child welfare plan and a special ed plan and a mental health plan, but rather that we begin to see the whole child in his, in his or her compre comprehensiveness. And so that we can begin to help them heal if they need healing, but also improve and make use of the opportunities to achieve their goals and aspirations. We assume that this will mean that we need to change our system somewhat so that they're youth and family led, that they're grounded and obviously with a lens of equity and justice, that they become culturally relevant, community-owned and strength-based. Next slide. Previously, we've identified these 10 steps as the process. Uh, today, we're gonna be covering six and seven. The previous ones covered the earlier steps and the next one will cover the, the remaining steps. Um, for today, next slide, Richard or Stefan, is uh, determine the public funding streams, number six, and then develop action plans where we have some deliverables and timeframes so that we can coordinate and align roles, responsibilities, and resources. Absent this kind of collaboration and coordination, it's, it's very hard to imagine that a one child, one plan 
is attainable or sustainable. And with that in, my, in backdrop, um, today it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Katie Eckert and Pam Smith. Each will uh, has, has made significant impact in the greater uh, ecosystems in California over their careers. Um, both will give them give a little bit more introduction for themselves. But as we begin, Katie, could you give us a couple of examples of um, some of the key definitions that we're going to cover later today? Sure. Yeah, I think that some of the, the um, things that are really critically important is for us all to have a common vocabulary when we're talking about financing things, um, because all of our funding streams are complicated. They all have different requirements, and we have to know how to manage them. And so speaking that common language is important. So a couple of terms that you should know. I mean, so leverage. So leverage is the use of state or local funds to earn or draw down additional federal funds. Certified public expenditure. Certified public expenditure is local governmental or state funds actually expended and then certified as expended by a governmental entity. A lot of times we call it just CPE. Blending funding. Blending funding is when multiple funding sources come together for one project and can be intermixed and applied to any and all aspects of the project costs. Grading funding is a little bit different. It's when multiple funding sources support different aspects of one project, but cannot be intermixed. Each funding source would support specified project costs. Funding drivers are the factors that affect the funding and or reimbursement rates for a particular program. And claiming is the act of submitting bills or invoices or claims uh, to draw down the federal or state funds. Thanks, Katie. And Pam, as we're getting ready to start, mm -hmm. could you introduce yourself and also one or two examples where you, you, you saw us breaking barriers? Yes, thank you. I appreciate it. It's an honor to be part of this. I love breaking barriers because uh, it seems like there's so many of them out there. Um, so I'm uh, with San Diego County Health and Human Services, um, and we are a combined social service, public health, aging programs, one entity um, organization. And when I came on board, I, I spent 25 years working for the federal government, and then I came on board with the county, and I love local government. I love that is where rubber hits the road. And one thing when I started though, I started running all the aging programs and we moved them all under one umbrella and there were 30 some programs, each with their own funding source, uh, with their own specific goal. And then I, everywhere I went, I found that with children's services and public health. And of course, I also served on a school board for 20 years. And you see a lot of the same thing, those funding streams that come in and um, it's confusing, uh, it's bureaucratic. It's frustrating. And I think the way I have dealt with and a couple of the examples I wanna give you is when you think about when we all pay taxes, that tax dollar that goes out of our pocket is one whole piece, right? That dollar goes out and through the wisdom of our elected officials at the state and federal level or wherever, that money comes back to communities but it's in a thousand pieces. And yet we're at the place where we have to try to make sense of that for the improvement of lives of our kids and families and seniors and community, but also efficiency in use of tax money, right? So how, how does all that work? And the way it comes, I think it takes a lot of innovative things. I'd like to give you a cup, just two quick examples. One uh, started actually through, and the other thing I will tell you this, it's, I think, my eyes glaze over sometimes on the issue of financing because there's this and then this role and then here and where you are. And um, obviously that's what makes the engine run, but it shouldn't be the driver of what we do. So one program we did, I was on the Chula Vista Board of Education, big district, 30,000 kids, 30, kids um, high uh, Hispanic, low income areas. And in those areas, we hadn't built a new school in a lot of years. And we as a community and our school leadership, our board were very involved in the community as well, thought 
let's start dreaming about what a school would look like on that west side. And what I will tell you is it truly was a dream because we had no money. We had nothing to even, how would we fund a school? What's it going to be? And um, we went through literally months of bringing the community in every other week on a Saturday morning and brainstorming what a dream school would look like. And again, it's really a dream when you have no money. But what came out where it was this vision, people could really put ideas up there because it didn't fit in a, in a financial category. It fit in what's best in our community. And we had different levels of government. We had county government, city government. We had seniors, uh, older adults. We of course had uh, staff, parents and student participation. And we designed a, a very um, uh, powerful vision of what this school could be, you know, dual language, intergenerational things, um, you know, the list just went on and on. And from that, we started going to find funding to, to build this school and get it up and running. And uh, a lot of pieces came in play. And part of it is getting all the right people there because I believe any kind of collaboration breaking barriers is about relationships. You have to know the people in your community, in different entities. You have to build trust with them and then come together and really start looking at what are community issues and problems. Let's brainstorm the solution. And that involves a lot more listening than it does telling. And uh, you know, any kind of great collaborative uh, effort has that in that we really start getting that. Uh, we found some innovation, innovative funding. The district sold some other property to get land. Uh, one of our utility contractors mentioned one day in a meeting that there was kind of this untapped money in um, California that's called, I always have to look at the uh, name of it because none of us had ever heard of it. And it had to do with money back that could come for, for facilities and building. Um, we pursued that. We ended up, because nobody would really heard of it, we ended up getting the money. There was complications with that because it had some debt with it. But all the people in the room were so tied to this compelling vision that they'd say, well, here's who else needs to be here. We need to have the chamber here. We need to have this group here and got them all in the room. And then we still ended up a little short of money and we reached out to philanthropic. In this case, it was John Walton and the Walton Foundation who had some focus on education, but he really did not like to spend money for capital funding. But we went to him and said, well, this state money is a one to 10 match. For every $1, we'll get 10 back. And that was compelling to him. Plus, he loved the idea of having an intergenerational campus. Because when I say that, I don't just mean programs. We built affordable housing for seniors on the campus of this elementary school. Wow. And so had a nonprofit come in, have them run it. It is up and running. It's been a success. It's been a star and a model of, you know, that people take great pride in. And it's still referred to as our dream school. Well, so compelling vision, the strong relationships, perseverance, and, and engaging more and more people. That's not a bad way to get started on how to uh, become innovative around financing. Thanks, Pam. Uh, there was a question about what was the name of that fund. So as people are asking questions, if you write that, just put it in the chat, because I have a hunch there's going to be a number of people reaching out to that after today. It's um, called Qualified, I'll tell you. Oh, no, no, put it in the chat. Put it okay. in the chat if you could. Okay. Steve, well, Steve okay. would it be okay if I could introduce myself? I was just going to ask you to do that before I put out the first question, please. Thank you. Um, so, so I realize I'm listed here as a human service leader in California. Um, I have worked in California counties for 25 years um, in five different counties, always involved with health and human services. So currently I serve as um, the behavioral health director for Monterey County. I also teach part-time for UC Davis, uh, continuing and professional education for social services financing classes. And I consult 
um, with a variety of small counties and nonprofits um, around financing issues, again, focused on, on health and human services programs operational in the state. So I, I just wanna echo some of the things that, that Pam said. Um, I have found that, that partnerships are key. Relationships are incredibly important. Um, getting creative, um, learning how to navigate complex funding streams with lots of strings attached. And so, so um, you know, we need to know the rules that go along with federal regulations and the federal funding requirements. And we need to know the strings attached to each of our funding source to be able to pull all the programs together. Uh, so it is highly complicated, but with that, it is also highly rewarding because with that work, with that effort, we can make collaboratively um, partnerships that bring tremendous amounts of uh, resources to our communities and serve people and our communities better together than we ever could alone in our own individual silos. Well, thank you for that. And I hope that everybody appreciates why we're, Richard and I are so enthusiastic about today's presentation and the presenters. So let's start with the, the first question that we had. How do we determine the best way to leverage the federal Medicaid dollars for youth in our schools? And, and again, uh, try to be sp uh, specific because this is more about the practice, not so much about the policy. So would either one of you want to take that one? So why don't I get started? I mean, so some of the partnerships that I've had in the past with schools uh, really have been kind of uh, looking at kind of a mental health connection um, and uh, where we will have uh, a mental health clinician uh, sometimes placed in the schools, uh, definitely with that kind of coordinated uh, connection to services. Sometimes, uh, you know, the schools have some, some required uh, uh, mandates for, you know, free and, and appropriate education and, and uh, mental health services that support that. Um, and so we're able to leverage the state funding that schools get with Medi-Cal billing for mental health services for, for the kids who qualify for Medi-Cal and, you know, need that, that type of service. And so, so um, it makes it possible for us to provide an extra set of services because we're bringing more service, you know, more revenues into the community by being able to leverage those federal dollars than the school could do on their own. Um, and so, so that's one of the really key partnerships that, that I have had with schools. Um, we continue to expand on, on this same concept today um, and, and look to you know, different opportunities and different needs that the, the schools are having um, and what can we do to engage uh, kids earlier, um, try to prevent more costly care needs down the road um, and, and really use our combined resources uh, in the way that draws down the most, most um, federal reimbursement to our communities. Katie, it's Richard really quickly wondered if you could just elaborate a little deeper on that and maybe identify two or three of those state school mental health sources that you're using as FFP match for Medicaid. Uh, I do not have the state or I do not have the school's financial information in front of me right now, so I can't tell you exactly what those are. Um, I do know that when I've had the conversations with schools, I've had the conversation of, you know, we've walked through to identify what uh, funding source they would be bringing um, forward. Um, and typically it's state general funds that, that have gone to the schools that have been unleveraged. There are some funds that are already leveraged with federal resources. And so we kind of have to um, clarify every time we, we look at a program to ensure that the, the funds are not already being leveraged in some way. Um, and so, so I don't have that piece, but, but again, um, it is state general funds that they get. We just have to confirm that they are non-leveraged and then we go ahead and um, uh, run them through, you know, in this kind of instance, 
uh, the, the behavioral health, specialty mental health uh, billing protocols uh, mm -hmm. to be able to leverage the, the direct services. So Katie, then uh, the ed person would have that information. And again, it builds on having the right people in the room. Absolutely. Pam, is there anything, Pam, is there anything that you would add to that? Yeah, I would add that I think the mental health funding streams are one of the most complicated of, <laughs> yes. of complicated funding systems. And then they keep changing. I was talking to our behavioral health folks and I, I don't have as much background in that finance. But they talk about, yeah, it used to be this way, then it changed. And, you know, in our county, and of course, schools can now do it themselves, or they can contract with county, or they go find other contractors. About 50% of our schools work directly with our county services, but then we still have to become the conduit for them to access services. And honestly, it's so confusing. Schools are very confused, even with the dollars they have of, of where, that it creates a huge barrier to, to making it easy for kids and families to get mental health services. Um, so one of the things without, you know, Katie knows more on the leveraging money and doing, but what one example we did with our agency and we're doing it, we have 42 school districts in our county and we have been having a really concerted effort to work with our schools over the last few years. And one of the things we do with each district is we look at our agency and we say, what services are you doing for this school? Are they, what eligibility, child welfare, public health, mental health, behavioral, where is that? And because we didn't even know within our agency what all was going on there. And we mapped it. We put it on a map of that district. We're doing these programs with details of who's doing what. Then we brought our Eight human health and human services executive team together with the school districts team, all of their leadership, site people, everybody there shared this information to get everybody on the same page. Who's doing what? What are the mental health services that are coming in here now? And where are they? And when I say we mapped them, we mapped it's at this school. It's not at this school. So we not only had them, but where. And then we use that as a, a catalyst um, with a neutral facilitator. So nobody was running this meeting to say, what are our common goals and interests in working together? And again, we mm -hmm. had listening. And for schools, they listed, and one of their priorities was chronic absenteeism. It's a huge problem in up and down the state. And, but you have to break that down. Why are they missing? Where are they? In the end, we set three common goals and agreed that we were all going to work on that. And mental health was a big piece of that on absenteeism, families, kids, where. But I, I say that because, first of all, everybody's got to figure out where we are and where we aren't, what we have and what we don't. But then our agency shifted the way they were spending some of our money based on what we heard from schools in order to meet these goals. That includes uh, child welfare services, because what we found is a whole lot of the kids that are missing are foster kids, those are our kids. Same thing with kids in, 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 in juvenile justice system. Many of them have some mental health, behavioral health problems. But when you bring together these big entities, school systems, county structure, particularly in this state, and get on the same page and start setting some common goals. So again, it goes back to those first points. You gotta know each other, you gotta trust each other, you gotta get there. And we have moved the needle big time on these as to we set yeah. outcomes, we measure it. And you know, the other thing is we built these relationships, not all perfect, but you know who to call, you know what to do. We have regular meetings, we have committees that work on it. And are we aligning all of our finances in the best way to get the best outcomes. So that's the overall question and clearly mapping it and then seeing how you could achieve the vision that you've already come together seems to be a critical first step there. Would you agree, Katie? Anything Absolutely. Yeah. I, I almost wonder if you have that mapping template, that would probably be a good resource, though I have a hunch it might be, if it's idiosyncratic just to San Diego, maybe not, but that would be helpful. Um, you know, it is, it is a good model to share and I'll get you a copy of it because literally we outlined the district 
And then we color coded our programs, eligibility, mental health, those kinds of things. And then they are at the school site because a visual thing like that, simple as it is, got us talking. There was a detailed attachment about what all those services were, you know, all the, the funding right. for that. But it, it, it you know, you got to get everybody on the same page. I think one other thing that I just kind of want to add about leveraging the federal Medicaid dollars for youth at our school site, so, so not using school money, um, there is a lot that we can do just kind of from a collaborative program standpoint where we have a presence. So say behavioral health has a presence at the schools and we're using MHSA funds. We might be using some social services realignment funds for, for um, kids involved in child welfare. Um, and then again, we're uh, looking at billing services to uh, federal uh, Medi-Cal programs. So, so through the behavioral health, specialty mental health. Um, we also have used uh, California SB 163, California wraparound funds, um, juvenile probation funds. Uh, it, you know, we can get really, really creative about who our prospective partners are. Uh, and typically I start by identifying um, the population we're serving, who else touches their life. Um, and mm. so, so if there are other agencies that touch an individual's life, there's probably some overlap in service and some overlap in responsibility, which means that there's a funding opportunity that goes along with it. Well said, thanks. Um, well, then move, since we've been in behavioral health, like, let's go to that fourth question. How are private managed care companies and behavioral health partnering to close gaps in access and care coordination? I know with all the Cal AIM work and in lieu of services and enhanced care management, case management, that's a big issue right now. Any thoughts? From it is a big issue. And I'm going to say that this is still under development. So there are a lot of discussions right now going on about developing a uh, transition of care tool or an identification of level of care tool because specialty mental health is supposed to serve those individuals who are most severely impacted and then the mild to moderate system is supposed to serve the other individuals. So these tools are, you know, th there's been a lot of subjectivity in determining whether someone should be served by the county behavioral health system or through our managed care programs. And the interpretations have been different from county to county. And so that's, that's created a lot of confusion throughout the state. There is definitely infrastructure that hasn't been developed yet. We do not have sufficient providers available in all of the systems to meet the need that exists. Um, and so right now under CalAIM, one of the key things being developed is this kind of level of care identification and transition tool to kind of really look at each individual, their functioning um, at a given point in time to determine who should have primary responsibility for, for serving them. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, there's times when someone might need to step up to, to county mental health, and there's times when someone might step down towards, you know, kind of managed care um, treatment options. So I'm eagerly waiting for that. It is actively in development. Um, and I think that we have an ETA of an implementation date for that of July of, um, I think it's July of 2022. Yes. Um, and so, so that is, is something, you know, I think is critically important. I think some of the other pieces is just kind of discussing and working out um, regionally. This is again about building those partnerships and building those relationships and identifying where there are gaps or people have had uh, barriers to getting access to the care that they need, trying to make treatment and access to, to mental health care seamless so that, so that it is less visible to the individuals we serve as to whether we're, we're kind of at the, the open door that directs them into managed care programs or mm -hmm. whether managed care might be an open door that is helping direct them into specialty mental health programs. Uh, so that coordination of effort um, is, is definitely something that, 
that we all have a responsibility to keep working towards. And then, um, you know, and, and the funding, the funding is still a, a big unknown under Calame. So, mm -hmm. so again, there's more coming on that front, but it is very exciting to know that there's going to be the enhanced case management benefit mm -hmm. through uh, the managed care programs to, again, try to help facilitate that seamless service. Um, and then the in lieu of services, um, which again is, is county by county, um, you know, it, it, that the, the services there are optional and de decided by each managed care plan. But again, it's, it's kind of more of the whatever it takes approach of like, how can we ensure the health and well being of our local community? and, and um, provide some additional supports that are not traditional uh, managed care benefits. Nice, Pam, I'm gonna ask you the same question in a second, but Kate, do you ha Katie, do you have any tools that you've been using as you proceed in this process? Because if so you do, far, and, yeah, yeah, I mean, or so- Or is each so, one uh, case by case? It's case by case. I mean, the really the biggest thing right now is staying in communication um, with my managed care plan and for us to be partnering together to try to, to um, figure out what's going to work for our local community and then providing each other resources so that we can advocate with the Department of Healthcare Services appropriately to support our community's needs. And then I also, I, I work with the County Behavioral Health Directors Association um, and advocate at the state level uh, for, for what I see as the needs of our local community okay. and, you know, the state of California as a whole to, to really improve the okay. system and, and design it in a way that is going to meet the needs of, of the people we serve. Yeah, and Pam, anything you want to add in terms of San, what's happening that you know of in San Diego or elsewhere around partnering between behavioral health and the county government? Um, well, and I will just add, and schools, so our and behavioral schools. health, our partners, because schools are, are so much of this. Uh, we, so San Diego County is a large county, like most of the counties in this state. And so we break down our county by geographic regions, so six, you know, east, south, different. And then we have real structured government in each of those. And then we ask all of our providers, like our mental health providers, they meet, we break it down and, and meet with the schools in that same geographic region. And we meet on a regular basis. Um, we have formed in these regions, um, we call them Live Well Leadership Teams, where they're, we're looking at, at not, we're looking at physical health and active living as well as, but behavioral health comes in a lot. So all of that comes together. So we have a, a forum, if you will, set up that we meet regularly for as these issues come up and we developed a loop back system. So we would tell schools, here's your, who you call, here's where it is. And we'd hear from school as well. I called, I didn't hear. So we tried to even tighten that, that they could let us know. We're gonna try to track where, what, cause these people were falling through the cracks, you know? Mm. So develop systems at the really nitty gritty level with this because it is an evolving place and at least how do you know the dollars we have are best spent and then of course that dialogue of listening um, and then uh, w part of it I think comes with when you really do that you not only see what you have but you see what you don't have and you become an advocate for what should be in some of these it's like some of the Katie referenced some of these gaps and and where they are and I think I think it's really important for us to feed that upstream as well the look this isn't and here's the problem um, that that we see with that. The last thing I would say with that is I think given these uh, kinds of when you have these structured relationship times to get together, plus we have an annual summit that's countywide, but then we break it down um, that um, you have to start building again, I'll go back to what you're dreaming or what you think it should be and designing because sometimes money will become available and you would have to scramble to come to up with the right grant request to fit this, right? That happens all the time with federal. And, and now right now there's a lot of money coming from the state and federal government. 
And if you're starting from ground zero on, oh, here's the money, what can we put together to fit the money? I think you're behind the curve and probably mm. not as efficient a program versus if you already have some ideas, relationships, things put together, and then you mm. can go in and tweak it with where the money is. Well said. And, and so we'll get to opera in a second, but is, do either of you want to just give one or two examples of blending or braiding dollars in your local system? Sure. I mean, so, so for instance, um, you know, I talked a little bit about about um, you know getting schools money, uh, state general fund money from schools, and then being able to leverage that dollars and um, you know, provide mental health services uh, and build them through specialty mental health and bring down federal revenues to to um, uh, basically make the dollars stretch twice as far as they would be if the schools secured the the services directly instead of through the mental health plan. I think that is one of the key pieces. Some of the other places where, where we have really had um, some success is using California wraparound money. So again, that social services realignment money uh, to match for, for uh, behavioral health, specialty mental health billing. We have used um, specialty mental health um, as well for when we have uh, child welfare parents who have uh, mental health or substance use needs, again, provided services to those, those individuals um, through specialty mental health um, or drug medical health. Um, and then social services provided the matching funds for, for the services. So instead of social services having to pay the full cost of the treatment, um, again, we're able to bring in a considerable amount of federal revenues mm -hmm. to offset some of those costs. Um, nice. We've had partnerships with First Five, serving serving um, our, our kids up to age five, where First Five gives us those dollars that are then able to be used as match for drawing down funds. Um, some of the programs that we've done with First Five dollars are blending and braiding funding because because we know, okay, first five can only serve kids up to age five. So what other source of funding can we bring in to serve kids that are older than, than um, age five and, um, and then still have that kind of like one comprehensive program uh, that, you know, doing, doing whatever it happens to be, whether it's, you know, uh, going out to homes and doing kind of like, you know, some Kind of enhanced services in homes, um, whatever that happens to be that that we needed. So, well, I'm, lots I'm of places to be creative. I'm chuckling because I was uh, once you said uh, first five. I was going to ask Ron. He mentioned uh, Ron Powell. He mentioned something in the chat about first five dollars, and I wondered if he would say a little bit more than than what you just highlighted. Ron, if, if, if uh, Stefan, if you could unmute Ron. There you go, Ron, you're good. All right, well, um, be glad to do that. So we started providing mental health services to children under the age of five. And in order to do that, then we, um, we involved first five and they put up the 50-50 match to be able to draw down the EPSDT dollars. So in addition to that, because many of these young children also need other services to enhance their, um, their mental health capacity, like sensory integration, for example, uh, is very useful for under five. And that's not a service that is uh, fundable with EPSDT. Then we used MHSA dollars uh, to be able to uh, provide both intensive speech and language services, as well as sensory integration uh, for those children who required that as all part of the package for our zero to five. I might also say that we tapped into for a while the CAPIT money from the um, Department of, uh, I think now it's Health and Human Services, used to be the old uh, Child and Family Services. Uh, there are some sources of money that, um, that we actually had to just turn back. And the reason why is it's way too onerous 
to try to jump through the hoops that are necessary to draw down the small dollars that you actually get from that source. So I would say that not every, every dollar is uh, equal in terms of its beneficial nature. Uh, you kind of have to pick and choose to see which ones you can use and then slot it into those categories of students that you're serving to serve them best. Thanks, Ron, for mentioning the administrative burden that's often overlooked. And uh, Pam, I saw you nodding when he was shaking your head yes when Ron was talking about first five. And I know how proud San Diego is about our first five. So do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, our, our first five, and I, your point was an excellent one, Ron. Um, our first five's great. They work very collaboratively. We often use some money there to match because they have a little more leeway. You know, it's a broader uh, definition to match and bring other money down of needs that we have identified and other ways to, to match, like your, your example with that. So they're, they're a key partner in you. And I think you look for some of those that have a little more uh, leeway with their money. Uh, we do have examples of blended dollars, but I think we do more of, of I guess, braiding um, as Katie described it, because we, so that means each entity Keep, keeps and maintains their own funding stream, but it comes together, right, to, to do this program mm -hmm. because of the reason that you need that expertise in that funding. You know, what's the compliance? What's the auditing? Where are we? So once we decide we're doing it, it's more that we will um, decide how, how to best uh, put that together, yet still meet all those requirements. One example, you asked me for an example of, of us uh, coming together with different streams of, of money. We uh, have San Pasquale Academy, which Steve, I'm sure you're uh, well aware of. It's a residential school for teenage foster kids started um, almost 20 years ago now. This uh, was for kids that were bouncing around the system, weren't graduating. And the idea being that this would be, a, it's a beautiful campus up by our wild animal park. Um, and the county bought the money um, and that we would have a residential, they, they're not, they, they can opt to go there or not, but it's a school, residential school with all kinds of full school activities, sports, music, things. And with the goal being, we're gonna improve our graduation rate, especially for kids that are bouncing around the system and where they're going. And that involved a lot of different funding. Of course, child welfare dollars, the county had to use general purpose revenue to actually buy the property up there. It was an old Seventh-day Adventist school. So we bought the property. Uh, our county office of ed came in and with their funding stream because they run the school, the actual school piece that's there. Um, but then we also brought in a nonprofit that would be oversight of the whole campus and run it. And they have multiple different funding streams and found as they worked with it, saw needs and went after other funding. Uh, one of the other funding things we did, we added older adults on that campus. There was some extra housing and in exchange for reduced rent, seniors moved on there and their job description was, um, is care about these kids and just do the things that caring adults would do for kids. Mm -hmm. And they do. And it's been very successful. It's in the news lately because now California and the feds have changed the, the, funding that can come with group homes. And I think we all know there's some, that's probably good. Kids shouldn't grow up in a group home, but this is kind of a unique setting and it's been very successful. They have a very high uh, graduation rate and a very high rate of kids going on to college because they help them. They, and of course they do literacy training. They do, I mean, all kinds of things. And it's just been great. And one point like as kids go off to college and then at holidays, they'll often come back and stay with the seniors because they don't have a home to go to. So it's been a great model that's got a numerous kinds of funding coming in, but it works. Um, it's a compelling vision. It's well, been a compelling outcome as well. I, I think you're raising the question of even when we put something together that's successful and it's going, it's working, sustainability becomes an issue. And we'll come back to that question in a moment, but Richard, I know that you had a question that you in the chat that you wanted to bring up and also to let people know, um, we intend to go to about 410, 415, if that works for folks. So if you have questions, by all means, uh, please put them in the chat where, uh, put them in the chat. I guess that's the simplest way I would say it. 
Richard, go ahead. Your question. Thanks, Steve. Um, Katie, you've uh, you've mentioned a couple of times uh, the SB 163, the California wraparound monies, the 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 monies that are now realigned under a 2011 budget act. Um, for folks unaware, the history on this is that this this was the state's effort to actually build systems of care uh, back in 1997. Now we don't we we called it wraparound, but in essence. It, the intent was to, to provide match, to draw down Medicaid, to make a, a, a jointly funded um, whatever it takes kind of model across the state. The problem that we had under realignment, as you know well, is that in many counties, particularly small rural counties, those dollars were swept up in a post realignment environment and, and the social service entity, the Department of Social Services at the county level or the Health and Human Services Agency lost access to those dollars. So my question is, and it's a little technical, but I think it's critical for anybody that's on, on, on with us today that, 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 that would like to maybe reclaim these dollars is can you recommend, are there strategies or tactics that one would use uh, as a department head or a, a senior fiscal manager to try to reclaim those SB 163 dollars that the county may have swept up or re, realigned elsewhere? Uh, that it's a, such a flexible source and it can be used in so many different ways. Uh, if I wanted to reclaim them from my county, <laughs> how would I go about doing that? So I think that there's a couple of pieces here that, that um, uh, you know, so again, um, prior to 2011, uh, 1991 realignment paid a portion of the SB 163 costs and then state general fund paid the other portion. At, at, you know, in 2011, the state general fund portion was realigned to counties and we came up with 2011 realignment. So right now, there's no federal participation in SB 163. Um, and in fact, it is fully funded from 1991 and 2011 realignment that goes to social services. So social services frequently will ask the question, well, why should I bother doing anything for the SB 163 program because I'm not leveraging the funds. It is just, you know, county dollars. I'm either spending them directly in my child welfare programs or I'm spending them, right. spending them, you know, through the SB 163 program. The reality is that there are some benefits and there still are some ways that we can save money collectively. So one of the biggest pieces is in relation to say, um, probation kids involved in child welfare. So a probation kid might not be Medi-Cal, uh, might not be a, a Medi-Cal beneficiary, but by putting them in an SB 163 slot, they are now Medi-Cal eligible. Therefore, the services that they are provided are now billable to Medi-Cal. So we are able to Put that, you know, use that SB 163 slot, use social services realignment, the SB 163 designated funds as the match, provide billable services through behavioral health and get, get additional revenue supporting our collective programs and supporting that individual as a whole. Um, and the biggest benefit here is when it is a child who is not medically or does, is not qualified for Medi-Cal um, just on the basis of their normal life. They have to go in that SB 163 slot to be able to get that, that Medi-Cal eligibility. And so that, that is where I see the, the biggest difference. And that is one of the places where we can have discussion um, about, about really focusing on, on improving things. I mean, apart from that, you know, there is absolute truth that social services realignment can be a match for, for behavioral health, uh, Medi-Cal billing for, for general population, um, you know, if there are child welfare involved uh, in, in this, you know, CPS world, um, social services realignment can support uh, treatment through behavioral health and provide the match directly. But it's by that using that SB 163 slot that we get some kids uh, qualified for Medi-Cal and then, then have that ability to, mm -hmm. to generate the Medi-Cal services and the federal dollars. 
Thanks. Uh, there's a great question uh, for maybe either of you. Uh, how do you uh, engage and then help uh, uh, someone who has a mindset of scarcity? Well, I think that my reality is that yes, resources are scarce. None of us have sufficient resources to, to do everything that the community needs on our own. That's why it's critically important for us to come together and figure out how can we use our resources collectively to draw down as much federal revenue and increase the resources we have to serve the community in, in the best way we possibly can. So working together, we can have more resources than if we work by ourselves. Got Absolutely. It. Pam, and anything I, you would add? Yeah, yeah, I would just add, I totally agree. And I think you start those conversations maybe with a cup of coffee. I mean, if you've got an individual, you've just got to sit down and, and sometimes have a one-on-one, -on -one, uh, go back to the, you know, listening, you know, the why, what, you know, the hearing their, con legitimately hearing their concerns. Um, and, and to Katie's point, really, you know, we've got to make the most efficient use of the money we have, but listening to, to what they have to say and, uh, taking it back to to our source and seeing how we move on. Um, you know, it is a lot of people on here know a whole lot, you know, those things ebb and flow. Uh, but, you know, that that view of scarcity to me is a view of we can't. It's a bit of a defeatist. Um, and there's a lot of dollars that come in. Uh, again, when you look at these dis different systems, um, and they're full of people that went into this line of work because they care about people and they care about their community. And I think they get as frustrated by the bureaucracy or the can't mm. or they're not meeting the need. And I think somehow making sure we're listening to, to those very frontline people about needs and then making sure whatever dollars we have um, are, are addressing some of those issues. I think that one, one other thing I just would add is that I always have the discussion about what is our common goal for the community? What is our common vision? You know, what mm -hmm. can we do to support that? You know, so I'm not there about self-interest. I am there, you know, to support that common goal of really maximizing services that our community needs. And how can we do that together? Um, because because I think that when we just represent our self-interest, you're not going to have a good conversation. It's not going to get, to get traction. We have to have that, that common vision that we're both committed to. I think yeah. both of you uh, are speaking the same, two different sides of the same coin. You're thinking about it, how do we engage and agree on the community? And I think Pam is referencing, and how do we agree person to person, like why are we doing this work? And then why, why are we gonna do something different because? Um, beautiful. R Richard, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I was just gonna highlight here. I think we're getting to the crux of why uh, collaborative funding is one of the four pillars of systems of care, right? Because in reality, uh, we all each department head lives in an, in an environment of scarcity, but when you come into a, alignment and collaboration, the scarcity disappears, particularly in really? California. Uh, uh, California has revenue sources that other states only um, dream about. And, and we, we can and have done things. I mean, first five monies don't exist in other states. MHSA money doesn't exist in other states. Uh, we, have, we have richness in California that is unparalleled. And so uh, we have this incredible opportunity to maximize that in a system of care environment, but you never know what all the other partners' monies are until you're in the sandbox together, which is why this is pillar number four. Well said. well said. Richard, if you go to the next slide, because I think uh, as we begin to uh, look towards the future, I think uh, Katie or Pam, either one want to start on your thoughts on how Cal AIM is going to impact sustainability going forward. And there's clearly some concerns about a lot of the app, uh, APRA money is, um, you know, one time money and what happens afterwards. And then we've all lived with. Uh, circumstances when the project, you know, grant ends, everything stops, you know, so uh, how, how do you think we're going to, how can we focus and make sure the successes are sustained? 
so um, one of my my um, uh, responsibilities or, or one of the things that I'm involved in uh, at, through County Behavioral Health Directors Association is actually negotiating rates with Department of Healthcare Services for behavioral health for Cal AIM. Um, I think that where we end up with that is going to be the really key driver as to what sustainability mm. looks like. Um, you know, the, the discussions and, and, you know, and obviously the advocacy on the county side or from the county behavioral health side is that number one, we really have to be able to have at least cost, uh, we, we have to be able to, to um, cover our costs to provide services. Um, I think that some of the, also the, the, the potential ways that, that we are going to find some benefits is, you know, we have discussions about um, reducing cumbersome documentation processes that, that get in the way of us being able to recoup federal funds, um, you know, take up valuable staff time, which then makes the staff, you know, kind of uh, less productive, you know, so, so we want to be able to have more one-on-one -on -one time st uh, staff to client as opposed to staff just doing paperwork. Um, and then, then, you know, we really have a, a really, oh, cumbersome audit process where, where there are audits that happen from eight, nine, even 10 years back where money is still taken away from counties based on, based on potentially documentation errors that were 10 years ago. Not the fact that, a, you know, it, it's not that a service wasn't provided, it's that an I wasn't dotted, a T wasn't crossed, and therefore there's, there's you know, audit exceptions that take money back now. Those things are, are you know, create a lot of uncertainty for, for county operations. And so what my hope is under CalAIM, we will have certainty. We will know what our rates are we will be able to build our budgets and structure our programs um, according to, to those rates and, and really know what, um, what our community needs. And so really kind of like focus how we dedicate our staff time is going to be, be based on, on the community needs because we'll have a little bit more flexibility. Um, and again, that, that some of these inefficient, ineffective and bureaucratic processes will be reduced. Um, nice. So much more to come still. Clearly. Pam, you, any, anything you wanna to add to that? Oh, I think well said, Katie. I Agreed. More to come. <laughs> more to come. Um, well then, as we begin to wind down, um, unless there's a, a question that's still not been asked yet. Um, seems to me that uh, what we've done is really begin to think about, here's, the, here's what I've heard, <laughs> I guess this is the way to put it, that it becomes essential to collaborate and partner with the other key stakeholders in, this, in the, both in systems and in the community, that through that process, you want to, to develop uh, a, a vision for how you want to function now and what you want to achieve in the future. So you need to align your goals. Um, we need to map the resources currently available and the gaps so that we can figure out where we want to move forward and that we need to advocate for our vision. Richard, anything you'd want to add to that? I oh, just really appreciate uh, the wisdom in the conversation, uh, deep appreciation to Katie and Pam for bringing forward expertise that's uh, really needed across the state and Absolutely. two folks who've been walking the walk uh, for a while and getting dollars uh, connected. Uh, so thanks for that. Yeah. Any closing thoughts, uh, Katie, Pam? Again, I encourage you to reach out to any of your partners. Think about 
who you serve in common. So the, the, the individuals that you are serving, think about any other agencies that are involved in serving that same population, and then, then have coffee, reach out, start building those relationships, and start inquiring about what is it, explore what is it that you can do together better to draw down more resources collectively not just the self-interest, but collectively, what can you do better? Pam, anything? I, I agree totally. Uh, I think that summary was good of the things we've been saying. I would add, we found it very effective to have a, I mentioned it, a neutral facilitator at our meetings. Mm -hmm. um, so it wasn't the county running the meeting. It wasn't the school running because, you know, is that our self-interest or are we telling or where is it? And if you have, we found a really good facilitator who brought the dialogue out and kept you moving along. Mm. And um, getting all the right people in the room, I think is key. And then always asking who else should be in the room. Mm. Um, you know, that example at the school, it was a, a utility contractor who said, oh, have you heard of this thing? You know, so a lot of, of getting people excited about what you're doing. Uh, people do care about it, but, but um getting a setting a few hours of getting the right people in the room having a facilitated discussion getting to know each other you know having it in a way that there is ways to get to know really is our first important steps i think because to katie's point too you know all of us individually are not anywhere near going to have the impact and richard said it as we are coming together uh, but coming together is time consuming sometimes it's hard it's you know, everything changes. But I think if you set that up as the way we do business, it's not just uh, an occasional thing we do. Mm. Um, the way we do business, I think we have more success. Oh, well said. Yeah. And it's a good lead in uh, to our inquiry for October. But just want to remind everybody that uh, Pam, Katie, if you have any resources you want to bring, we'll post those afterwards. Uh, the chat box will go up and uh, the recording and the website and the PowerPoint will be up within a figure about a week. Uh, but I just want to, to build on what both Pam and Katie were saying that the last masterclass is going to be on shared community and that flows from this quote that come, the two quotes that come directly from our toolkit, which has a slew of financial resources for California in there. So I re uh, uh, encourage you to go back to the toolkit and take, take a look at some other things as well. But that all children and families function within the context of local community circumstances and conditions. None of these systems are in isolation. They may be act in silos, but they don't, live, they don't function in isolation. And that this, this second quote is even more, no one system has the resources and the mandate and the research and the reach to successfully serve every youth social, emotional, behavioral and developmental needs. If we want healthy, vibrant, successful youth and, and adults, then we have to see another way of being comprehensive with them. And so these are our questions that we're starting. We look forward to some other questions that you might give beforehand um, and we look forward to seeing you in October. See, uh, can I add one last point? That sure. Thought. We were working on a project in a part of the county that we had particular serious problems with our child welfare system and not functioning and in, in a more conservative part of the county that didn't appreciate government anyway. And, you know, in fact, they referred to them as baby snatchers and, you know, um, so you can imagine the morale, the problems, all the things that were going on. But we started to revamp that system and we did a lot of listening and bringing everybody together. But, but as we started coming up with our vision, we also brought in a marketer who helped us turn our bureaucratic language into <laughs> um, more meaningful uh, things that the com that community could relate to when you're doing this and wow. you're talking about, you know, what is it? Child protective, child welfare. And I can, you know, the charge, everything. Well, it came down to a term called neighborhoods for kids. Mm -hmm. And you start, you know, our vision became simple about, you know, where, where children can feel safe and be treasured. I mean, where we become experts in finance, we become experts in, 
in rules and a lot of that, but to, to create that compelling image, to, to bring our community together, I think sometimes we have to really look at how, how are we communicating that? Mm -hmm. And it was, it was very powerful. It helped mm -hmm. us a lot. And we still have run the program with that and we've expanded it countywide. Oh, well said, thank you. That's a great example. Um, all right, uh, then uh, thank you. Uh, Everyone, we wish you well. Have a good rest of your day. Stay well, and we'll see you in two months. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, Katie. Thanks, Pam. Adios.